I'm pretty happy. Why am I happy? Glad you asked. Let me tell you. I'm happy because I'm planning out my next D&D campaign. I've been working a bit on the outline, some of the background story, uh, ideas for, you know, characters and plot lines and things like that. I like dreaming up this kind of stuff. It's, it's the thing that I enjoy most about running a campaign. But it has brought to mind some ideas about like what it means to progress through different tiers of play in a D&D game. And obviously, because I'm me, <laughs> I, I thought about what has been lost from the transition from 4th edition to 5th edition. Um, and one of those things is tiers of play. But say, Brock, tiers of play still exist. Well, yeah, kind of. Um, there, tiers of play do exist in 5th edition. Uh, they are numbered from 1 to 4. Uh, 1 being, what is it, levels 1 to 4. Tier 2 is 5 to 10. Tier 3 is 11 to 16. And tier 4 is 17 and up. 17 to 20. Um, and these tiers are kind of defined by the sort of, like, the general things that casters can do. You know, those are the, the, the level bands where your cantrips level up. Uh, you get new uh, spell levels that represent sharp increases in power and versatility for casters. Uh, the tiers don't really have much of a meaning for marshals. Uh, fighters do get extra attacks at those levels. I believe it's the same levels. Um, but beyond that, like, they're, they don't really have any marked improvement at those levels. Um... <clears throat> there's a uh, and and this is different than tiers of play in 4th edition. And here's why I think the difference is really meaningful. Tiers of play in 4th edition have entirely to do with the sorts of stories that the characters are supposed to take part in. In heroic tier levels 1 through 10, you are local heroes, uh maybe uh, uh, you know, heroes to a particular kingdom. You are dealing with kind of local issues. You are nevertheless heroic. Um, in Paragon tier, levels 11 through 20, you are dealing with more worldwide or, or maybe continent spanning, uh, uh, problems. You know, it sort of upgrades the, the scale of the issues that your characters are dealing with. Um, and then at uh, Epic Tier, which is 21 to 30, you have more either like the entire world or even possibly the multiverse, depending on uh, what sort of setting you're in. Yeah, you know, these are the kinds of things that your characters are dealing with. And you get uh, commensurate abilities to help you deal with that. And I'm not talking about like more powerful attacks, though you do get that. I'm talking about things like the Paragon Path and the Epic Destiny as a game construct. It sort of really signifies that at these levels, in these brackets of levels, your character is undergoing a transformation of what they are capable of and what they are expected to deal with. Epic Destinies are so cool. Uh, their, their removal from the game for 5th edition is an absolute travesty. Uh, and if you have not played 4th, like, I, I, it's hard to even describe how much has been lost there. Paragon Paths as well, to a lesser extent. I think Paragon Paths, I mean, like, they are also cool. Uh, but they feel, Paragon Paths, to me at least, feel more like a character building decision. Um, like, it's, it's part of your build, you know, it's supposed to synergize with the other abilities. And probably that is in large part due to the fact that most Paragon Paths are tied to your class. And so they are naturally going to expand upon and emphasize certain aspects of your class abilities. Um, whereas Epic Destiny is less commonly tied to specific classes, and therefore they're, they're more about, like, who your character is in terms of, like, the story that they are developing into. You know, these are things like you are a demigod, you are a archlich, you are, um, you know, a, 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 an archmage, these kinds of things, these sort of, you know, define, like, these are, are uh, things that define kind of who and what your character is. Um, and many of them give you some semblance of immortality. Some of them straight up give you immortality. Uh, the Dark Wanderer Epic Destiny cannot permanently die. Uh, 
12 hours after they die, their body disappears and they walk back from the afterlife. Like, hey, here I am. Uh, that is a, a Epic Destiny all about travel, walking places. They can walk anywhere. And so naturally they can walk back from death. And there's no limit to that. Uh, it takes a total of 24 hours for you to come back, but you could do that every single day. So these are the kinds of things that uh, uh, Tears of Play did in 4th edition. They really defined new arcs uh, and types of stories that are going to be told. And as your characters level up, the, the nature of the campaign shifts and adjusts and scales up with them. 5th edition doesn't really have this, uh, although you are kind of expected to be dealing with larger scale threats as you level up, obviously, because you are more powerful. There aren't really, like, set times when the scale of the, the issues that you're dealing with need to improve. Um, and different characters scale at different rates, so it's hard to say, like, when a whole party should be dealing with X threat if you don't know what the party's composition is. You know, a party of wizards and clerics and druids probably are going to be able to handle the big bad evil guy who's plotting to destroy the world much sooner than a party of fighters and rogues and barbarians. You know, uh, even, even like aside from having critical roles missing in, in the latter party, you're talking about classes that don't really care what tier you're in. You're kind of just doing the thing that you do. And that is kind of the part of the dissonance, uh, or di not dissonance, the disparity between casters and marshals. And I don't really want to get into that again. So I've talked at great length about that issue. But there, like, even if you assume a well balanced party or a party that does more or less scale together, like, at what point should you upgrade to worldwide matters? Is that at tier four? Is that at tier three? You know, it's very poorly defined. And people have tried to put definitions on these, but they are incredibly arbitrary. And also, they don't really line up to the, uh, the actual play experience of these characters. Because the philosophy of who and what your character is doesn't change significantly from tier to tier. So the tiers are used to describe general bands of power, but they do not describe, as they did in fourth, the kinds of stories that the characters are meant to be dealing with. And I think that's a shame. That's a real loss. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think the storytelling style of fourth edition really aligns with the way that I tell stories. Uh, because my campaigns are all about heroes of destiny that are saving the world. There's actually, I'm, I'm gonna give you a little, little bit of lore about the setting that I run in, because I always run in my own custom setting when I run D&D. &D. Um, in, in my world, there is a, a cycle of destiny. Evil rises and great heroes then arise to defeat it. This happens over and over and over it has happened since the beginning of the world thousands of times. And the greater the evil, the greater the heroes. So there, there's different degrees of, of you know, how far this cycle goes before it resets. Uh, and so the, the player characters in my campaigns always play as these great heroes of destiny, um, arising to defeat whatever evil it is that, that arises. You know, your, your classic heroic fantasy. In if I were to try to do that in 5th edition, it would be a lot harder to justify calling the characters heroes of destiny, especially, like, they, they don't really... There, there is no mechanical significance to this arc. I would have to do that myself, and I'd have to basically create more content for the players just to make up for what the game is not giving us. Now, I'm, I'm all for giving custom content. I do it anyways, even in 4th edition. But I don't feel like I should have to. I, 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 uh, I resent that the game leaves that for me to do as a DM. I've got enough on my plate. You know, if I, you know, I should be able to do these kinds of stories baseline. And you can't in 5th edition. Because 5th edition is not written for the kinds of stories that I run. 
Uh, and I don't think, and as I've stated before in a previous video, I don't think 5th edition is good at heroic fantasy. It's not the genre that it's going for. Um, I've heard uh, OSR systems as being described as, like, fantasy Vietnam. And I think 5th edition doesn't go quite all the way there on account of the fact that you can just play casters and be fine. Uh, but if you are playing more sort of the, the archetypal D&D party, where you are a squishy wizard, uh, or you are a fighter, or you are a rogue, uh, then that kind of party might have a sort of fantasy Vietnam style of play. Although you still are going to have uh, more agency than I think that, that play style suggests. But 5th edition definitely leans into that, that direction. Whereas 4th edition is much more about heroic fantasy. You are great, powerful heroes, even from level 1. If there's a reason why they call it heroic tier. You are heroic right out the gate. Whereas in 5th edition, you kind of got to get to tier 2 before you can actually start doing heroic stuff. Um, and even then, like... Even then, because of the way that monsters are designed... It doesn't feel heroic. And I'm not sure that I can necessarily articulate why that is. Uh, you know, defeating a dragon in 5th edition oftentimes feels like you have just exchanged damage with a thing enough times that it... And I think this probably has to do with how... I think, I think that is probably the primary issue, is that monsters in 5th edition don't feel like the sort of dynamic threats that they do in 4th. Um, partly to do with the fact that uh, the action economy works the way it does. And her not not heroic actions. Uh, what is it called? Layer actions? No. Legendary actions. Legendary actions. They feel really cheap. They feel kind of cheaty because they, I think, are not well integrated into the system as a whole. Whereas uh, a fourth edition monster, like a solo monster... If designed well, and I, I recognize that 4th edition had some issues with solo monsters early on, but I think those have been addressed, not only in later publications, but also just it, when I make my own, there's a certain design philosophy you can follow to make sure that it doesn't end up with the same problems that the original ones did. But dynamic monsters are those that uh, that take a lot of, not just take a lot of actions, but like they have triggers and they have like a certain way that you're meant to approach them. You know, dragons in fourth edition have tail whips that trigger when, uh, on different things for different dragons. You know, so like one of them is like when you make an attack with combat advantage, or I, I, it might actually even specify if you are attacking while flanking, then it can tail whip you as a re reaction. Or another one is, you know, as soon as someone enters uh, their range, pff, tail whip, or, you know, the, or what is it? Um, if someone misses them with an attack, pff, tail whip. So each dragon has a sort of sig signature tail whip. And that's just one move. You know, the, then the dragons are also, they're breathing their breath, their breath weapon. When they first get bloodied, they recharge their breath weapon and can use it for free. You know, uh, I think there's at least one that can use their breath weapon when they are reduced to zero hit points. They sort of last hurrah, pff, that's really, that's really cool. And then they have like this combination of other attacks that they can do. And it's not just a dragon flying in the air, breathing their breath weapon. And it's not just like standing there going, I, uh, you know, attack three times and that's the end of my turn. Uh, there's, there's a lot more going on with these monsters. There's a lot more actions, a lot more thought that has gone into how to approach these monsters as a sort of tactical puzzle. And I think that is a big part of why monsters feel more dynamic in 4th edition. And dynamic monsters lead to a more heroic sensation when you defeat them. Um, because these monsters are clearly quite dangerous. Uh, even defeating kobolds in 4th edition, even a standard kobold, has tactical acumen that a 5th edition monster just usually does not. Uh, the ability to shift is a minor action. I've talked about, I made a whole video specifically on 4th edition kobolds that whose ability is so good that it actually kind of ruins the game a bit for players who are just learning. Uh, they, they tend to assume that what the kobolds do is normal and then they find out that it's not and they're like, oh, well, that sucks. I can't do the thing that the kobolds do. It sucks to suck, I guess. Uh, so... What I'm getting at is that uh, tiers of play is the original topic that I was talking about. <laughs> I 
and I've gotten wildly off topic, but Tears of Play, it, it means something entirely different in fifth than it does in fourth. And I think that there's a significant amount of storytelling potential that has been lost in that transition. And it makes me sad, but at the same time, like, I guess there's, I guess there's probably a certain type of player who wants it. That's what I was getting at with my, my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, comparison to OSR systems and the fantasy Vietnam feel is like that there is an audience for that. And so I guess I kind of get that fifth edition is going for them and not for my kind of storytelling, which is the heroic fantasy storytelling. So, uh, that's why I think it's, it's, it's one of many reasons why I think fourth edition is really the edition for me and why I think that there's a significant amount of value, not value, but there's a significant amount of appeal lost for me in fifth edition is that it is not fundamentally designed to tell the kinds of stories that I want to tell. Because I want to tell heroic fantasy. I want to, you know, great songs of heroes that are going to go, they're going to become legendary, passed down from generation to generation. That's the kinds of stories that I want my players to experience. And that combined with the, uh, the, the DM technique that I've mentioned, I guess not really a technique, but like the storytelling thing where each campaign that I run follows directly on the heels of the previous campaign. So characters in my next campaign will know about the characters from my previous campaign. They will have heard stories about them. Uh, and they might even meet some of them, or in, in this specific case, uh, they might find their remains because the heroes of my last campaign failed. And so they are dead. Uh, or are they? Anyways... Uh, and that's the kind of thing that I think is, is harder to do in 5th edition, um, simply because there, of, of the assumptions about who the player characters are in the larger world. Uh, and there's a significant amount of work that would have to be put in to change that about 5th edition. And you know me, I'm all about minimum possible effort. <laughs>